The God of love and peace be with you all, my dear friends in Christ. So, okay, I admit it. I have picked a perhaps somewhat controversial title for my sermon today. I have invoked a phrase that our president, Donald Trump, likes to use to, to call out news that, that he doesn't believe is true. And uh, that phrase, fake news, he uses that to, to great effect in his Twitter posts and, and speeches and in interviews and things. And, and it gets people all riled up. It gets people all excited. His political opponents, it drives them nuts. And here it is, in a sermon, in a pulpit, in the church of God. Well, I just want to make sure I put your minds at ease. Instead of calling to mind all this political drama over the last year or so, this is not going to be a political sermon. In fact, politics and the pulpit very rarely go well together. So we'll just safely leave politics in the background, and let's move on to the more important things, the spiritual things. Because the spiritual reality that we live in is there is a lot of fake news out there. It's always been that way, actually, ever since sin came into this world. There's always been false ideas about what God says. We have more fancy terms for it in the church. We say false teaching, false doctrine, heresy. But it's fake news. That's all it is. Fake news. Fake, fake news about the Bible. Fake news about God, about what God does, about Jesus. And if you're tired of all the fake news that's out there, how about the truth? How about the truth of what Jesus actually came to do? How about the truth of the righteousness that he wants you to enjoy with him forever? Like I said, truth is a, a precious commodity. It was that way in the days of the prophet Malachi. Malachi was, was living among the Israelites, and the Israelites had, had some false ideas about what God had come to do and what God was going to do. And, and Malachi was there to purify them of those false notions, to get rid of that fake news. It's about the year 400 B.C., about 400 years before Jesus was born. The Israelites were back from their 70-year captivity in Babylon. They had reestablished themselves in and around Jerusalem. The walls had been rebuilt and repaired. The temple had been rebuilt, although it wasn't nearly as big as the temple that Solomon built. And there they were. And the Israelites were ready. They were ready now. They had established themselves. And now they were waiting for God to come back to reveal himself and to, to make them into the great nation that they were hoping they would be one day again. Except that's not what God had in mind at all. And that's why Malachi had to come. Malachi had to <laughs> challenge those false notions, that fake news, and, and tell them what God really wanted them to know. And he had a great message for them a message of wonderful hopefulness. He told them that the Lord was coming soon and, and you would know it because his messenger was going to lead the way and, and announce his arrival. We know that messenger as John the Baptist and we know that because Jesus himself tells us that. He quotes this section of Malachi in chapter 11. Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John the Baptist. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. So we know John the Baptist is this messenger and, and his job was to get the hearts and the minds of the people ready for Jesus to come. Malachi calls Jesus the, the messenger of the covenant. Covenant is that great Old Testament way of, of talking about the promise of a Savior. The promise that God had made a long, long time ago to Adam and Eve when he promised that a child, an offspring, would be born who would crush the head of the serpent. And that covenant, that promise, was repeated all over the Old Testament. God repeated it to Abraham. When God told Abraham that his family would be a blessing to this whole world because out of his family would come the Savior. It was a promise that God repeated to Moses when he talked about the great prophet who would be brought forth from the family of Israel. It was a promise that God made to, to King David when he told King David that he would have a son, the son of David, who would reign on his throne forever and ever. It was that same 
promise that Isaiah talked about when he said that this child would be born to a virgin. But in all those different ways of God talking about this promise, the message was really the same. God would remember the sins of his people no more. And who else could that be but Jesus? And to help clarify things a little bit, Malachi says that, that this messenger of the covenant would come suddenly to his temple. And as we think about Jesus, well, we remember. Maybe you remember the story of the boy Jesus, 10, 12 years old in the, in the temple, talking, suddenly appearing there, talking to the teachers and amazing them with his depth of knowledge. Or maybe you remember Jesus preaching and teaching in and around the temple. And certainly you remember Jesus dying on a cross just outside of the temple, outside Jerusalem. Here was the Savior, the Lord who had come to his temple, the one that, that they were expecting to come. But Malachi says, who can stand the day of his coming? Who could stand it? Because the people in Malachi's day, they were looking for something far different than what Jesus would be. They, they were looking for an earthly king. They were looking for an earthly kingdom. They were looking for glory and prestige and, and to be the, the desire of all the nations again, just like they had been under King David and King Solomon. But that, that wasn't what the Lord had in mind at all. He sent this messenger of the covenant to be for them their savior, to rescue them from their sinfulness, to, to make a people who would be ready for the Lord, heart and soul. And that wouldn't be great and easy work. <coughs> Malachi says it'd be like a, a, a person refining silver, right? Melting silver, heat, power. Or a, a person washing and scrubbing a, a garment to get the stains out of it. This is not pleasant work here. This doesn't have a, a gentle sound to it. This is hard work because Jesus would have to come and, and root out all this fake news, all this false teaching, and replace it with the truth. But with the truth, they could be purified. And with the truth, they could be saved. I think back to Jesus' ministry of, of purifying. And, and one story kind of came into my mind. And, and I think it's one of the, the saddest stories from the ministry of Jesus. It's the story of the rich young man. You remember this story? The rich young man comes to Jesus very full of himself. He, he thinks that he's got it all figured out, that, that he can make himself good enough for God. And so he asks Jesus, what do I have to do to be saved? And Jesus says, well, you know your Bible. Go read it, right? What's it say? You love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do this and you'll live. And the guy says, well, I've been doing that since I was a little kid. I got this sorted out. And then we get a little break in the narrative and we are told, Jesus looked at that man and loved him. Loved him. Loved him with the, the same love that, that Jesus loved everyone. Loved him with the same love that would send Jesus to the cross. Loved him enough to tell him what he needed to hear. Not what he wanted to hear. Loved him enough to, to, to refuse to allow him to live in the lie that he was living in. And so Jesus said to him, one thing you lack. Go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And with that, Jesus crushes him. Destroys that fake news. Destroys the falsehood that that man was living in. And he goes away unhappy. Sad. Because he couldn't do it. He didn't want to. And that's, to me, what makes it so sad is because the answer was right there, right? Right there in Jesus. All he had to do was say, Lord, what do you expect me to do? How am I going to do this? But he wasn't ready for that. In fact, this whole story troubled the disciples enough that they asked Jesus, Lord, if this is the situation, then who can possibly ever be saved? And Jesus gives his disciples the answer that that rich ruler wasn't ready for yet. He says to them, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. That's, that's the reality, though, right? That, that's how people are in their lives. They, they live in this fantasy world of who and, and, and what they think Jesus ought to be. You know, a lot of people say, yeah, I want God in my life. Yeah, it'd be nice to have a little religion, and, and it's moral, and it's good, and it's nice. But on my terms, the way that I want it to be, God forbid that Jesus ever tell me to do something that I don't want to do. But Jesus has to root that out. 
St. Peter says in his very first letter, he says, it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And it makes me wonder, I wonder what kind of fake news we're holding on to in our own life about Jesus. So I got an anger problem. Okay, whatever, right? It's just my personality. It's, it's, who, it's how I am. I don't need to deal with it. Or what does it matter that I can't have a conversation without gossiping and, and trashing someone else? After all, everything I said is true. Or yeah, okay, so I drink too much, so I got this problem. I'll deal with it. Just give me some time. I can figure this out. Or okay, I've got a grudge. Well, you know, they got to come to me. I'm not going to go to them. Or, Jesus is nice when I need him, but, you know, most of the time I got things pretty well sorted out. But he better be there when I need him, right? Or, Jesus just wants me to be happy in my life, and I can use that to justify all kinds of behavior. Just wants me to be happy. I think we would be very, very poorly served if Jesus were to come to us and say, I, I don't think, if, if you think I'm okay with your sinfulness, if you, if you think that pleases me, then I don't think you have a savior. I once had a fellow tell me, it's, it just amazes me. Uh, this is a real story. A fellow told me, yeah, so I got a grudge with this other person, right? So what? I'm human. That's what he thought would justify him before a holy and righteous God, right? It, it's almost laughable if it weren't so pathetic. Because if we, if we feel this way, as, as we justify ourselves before God, as we make excuses for our sins, as we, as we brush it under the carpet or, or blame somebody else, Jesus will come to us at the end and say, I tell you the truth, I never knew you. We all must stand before the judgment seat of God and give an answer for our life. That's why... We need to listen to the, the Advent call that John the Baptist gives us today to repent, to, to take stock of our lives and evaluate them and compare them to what God says in his word. Jesus wants us to know the truth, the truth that he is our savior. It means that we gotta, we gotta put away the pride. We gotta put away the, the selfishness. We gotta put away all these excuses that we make and just come to the Lord as we are, with all of our ugliness of sin, and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Ah, now we're on to something now, right? Now we're starting to think God's way, the way of humility, the way of repentance, the way of forgiveness. Because now when, when we think that way, we can, we can go to Jesus as we are without making any excuses and, and just lay on him the burden of all of the ugliness of our sin. And we don't have to wish it away. We don't have to downsize it. We don't have to pretend it's not there. God's okay with it. Not that he's okay with sin, but God is okay with you coming to him and admitting the ugliness of your sin and the failures you've made and the disappointment that you feel you are to, to God or to yourself or to someone else. Because that's why he sent Jesus, to rescue you from all of that. So we don't have to try to make up to God what we've done wrong. We don't have to try and... and and hide our sin and, and pretend it's not as bad as it really is. We can give it all to him. And he can forgive it all. That's why he sent Jesus. And that's the joy that we have in repentance, isn't it? That, that no matter what we've done, no matter how awful we think our sins are, God invites us to come to him and plead to him for forgiveness. And he can take care of that, that ugly falsehoods that we live with and replace it with his truth that we're saved. And it is with that truth then in our hearts, when, when, when our hearts are set at ease with God, when we know that God loves us, then we can serve, right? Then we can offer our lives. That was the problem that the people of Malachi's day had, right? They were just going through the motions. They were just worshiping because they had to, right? Because they were forced to, because that's what they were supposed to do. There was no joy in it. There was no heart in it. And if they would just see that, that God was there to, to wash their sins away, that God loved them, then, then they could worship with a pure heart. And, and no matter what they did in their lives, God would be pleased with it because they had the right attitude. It, you know, it's, it's kind of like when, 
your one-year-old hands you their, their drawing that they've made. You know, they've scribbled their drawing, they've handed it to you. This is no great work of art. Sorry, one-year-olds, but this is no great work of art. But mom and dad are thrilled with it. Why? Because it comes from a pure heart. And your hearts are pure, purified by your Savior Jesus, which means you can serve. And if there's any joy in forgiveness, if there's any peace with God, if there is any relief from guilt and shame, if there is any happiness with your Savior, then you can go and serve in whatever way works in your life. Where, wherever God has placed you, whatever calling you have, whatever vocation you have in your life, you can serve there. And you know what? God is pleased with it. And you might look at it, you might think, boy, this is not a very impressive thing. Or, or what in the world am I supposed to do with my life? Or, you know, I look at this person, boy, they're really a person of God, but what about me? They, they must really impress God, but what about me? But when we serve in joy, when we serve knowing that, that God has washed away our sins and we're just joyful and pleased with that, God takes whatever offering you give to him, whatever service you have, and it is precious to him. Because you get to serve. And, and though our, our, the things that we do in our life, the what that we do, doesn't always match the why. <laughs> Right, because God's looking at the attitude. And when our attitude is right, that's what matters to God. But, but when, when we look at that and we say, boy, I wish I could do more. I wish I could do better. May this be your comfort. Your Savior is coming soon. Your Savior is coming soon and he will take you to be with him in heaven. And there, free from, from all the sin, all the fake news, all the falsehoods, there, free from it all, finally, you'll be able to serve the way that you've always wanted to. You'll be able to serve in righteousness forever. That's the truth, right? The truth is great. The truth is wonderful. The truth gives us peace. The truth relieves us from our guilt. And the truth is here. Tired of all the fake news that's out there? You bet. How about the truth? The truth that your, your Savior has purified your heart. The truth that you get to serve your Lord in righteousness now, for eternity. That's the truth. Amen.